This is going to be verse by verse of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. And this just happens to be one of the greatest passages on the rapture of the church. I've done videos on this before in the past, but I'm going through it again just because it is coming up in this verse by verse study. After we go through verses 13 through 18, I also want to talk more about the rapture and compare 1 Thessalonians 4 to Matthew 24. So stick around for that. And here in 1 Thessalonians 4, in these few verses, we learn many things about the rapture. The first thing we learn is the rapture is our hope. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. All Christians have a hope that the lost world does not have. When a lost man loses a loved one, he has sorrow and he is without hope. He doesn't have the blessed hope. And he's not looking forward to Jesus Christ coming back and meeting him in the clouds. And for a lost man, seeing Jesus Christ will be a dread. And they will hide in the dens and rocks when they see him coming at the second advent. Ephesians 2.12 says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The hope that all lost people are lacking is the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you are saved, then this should be a purifying hope. 1 John 3.3 3 says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Many who are against a pre-tribulation rapture of the church will claim that a pre-trib rapture belief will not produce fruit in your life. But actually it helps me and it will help you in your daily Christian walk. Because I know Jesus could come back at any moment. It is a purifying hope. Has anyone ever rebuked you and asked you is that the way you want Jesus to see you when he comes back? Since we believe the return of Jesus Christ is imminent, this should motivate us to not be caught in places we shouldn't be and not be participating in sinful things that we shouldn't be participating in because he could show up at any time and you don't want to be caught in that situation when he shows up. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Those which are asleep are dead in Christ, the dead in Christ. And many times the word asleep refers to someone that's dead and not to someone that's just snoozing. If you have loved ones who are asleep, then you can be sure to see them again. The next thing we can see from this passage is what group of people are leaving at the rapture. And it is all born again believers, people who have believed in the gospel. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are put into the body of of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The gospel is this. Jesus died. He died for us and rose again the third day. If you believe that and are placing your faith in that to get you to heaven, then you are saved and will go up at the rapture. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15.1-4. through 4. The people who go up at the rapture are born-again believers. And this would cover every saved person from the cross until whenever the rapture takes place. Old Testament saints aren't part of the body of Christ, so I don't believe that this would include them. And the next thing we learn is what happens to the saved dead at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The majority of verses in uh, 13 through 18 are about the dead in Christ. A man said one time, if the dead in Christ rise first, then that means they never were in heaven. But notice the verse said, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. The Bible teaches that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. At death, your body goes to the grave. Your soul goes to heaven or hell. And your spirit 
goes back to God. At the rapture, the bodies of the dead in Christ will rise and meet their souls that come back with the Lord. Their soul had been in heaven since the day they died. And 2 Corinthians 5, 8 lets us know that if we are absent from the body, then we are present with the Lord. Notice that verses 13, 14, 15, and 16 all mention the dead in Christ, the ones who are asleep. Verse 15 says those who are alive at the rapture will not prevent them which are asleep. The word prevent here means pre-event as in to go before. So why do the dead in Christ rise first? And there are a lot of jokes about this that probably aren't true. And the Bible says that after Jesus Christ's resurrection, that many of the bodies of the Old Testament saints arose from the dead. Matthew 27, 52 and 53, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So they arose from the grave and walked around. And this is where Hollywood stole the idea for the walking dead. Hollywood makes the zombies bad guys, but in the Bible, in Matthew 27 and 1 Thessalonians 4 in particular, they are the good guys. Satan knows what to betray as good and what to betray as evil, all for his gain. So do you believe that bodies of the Old Testament saints walked around and appeared to many? That's exactly what the Bible says. But I'm going to tell you something now that you probably won't believe. Maybe the dead in Christ rise first because they're going to walk around and appear to many just like many of the Old Testament saints did after the resurrection. A lost man's dead wife may show up at his door and give him the gospel. This gives the world one last chance before the tribulation starts. If you have read the Bible much, then you have read where it says the Jews require a sign. In the time of Jacob's trouble, God goes back to dealing with the Jew. If the dead in Christ walk around a few days, then this would be a great transition into a time period where there would be signs for unbelieving Jews. You say, well, that can't be true because the Bible says the rapture is in a, is in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The verses seem to say that our bodies are changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. While our bodies are changed in the twinkling of an eye, we may not go up in the twinkling of an eye. I'm not saying this as absolute fact, so don't get all bent out of shape. It's just something to think about. But 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 53 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So the dead in Christ, even if they were cremated, ate by a shark, chopped up in pieces or whatever, however they died, God will get their body back together and change their body into an incorruptible body. They will get a perfect body at the rapture. So what do we know so far? The rapture is our purifying hope. Those who are born again, having believed in the gospel, will go up in this rapture, and the dead in Christ will rise first and get a brand new body. Now moving on, another thing we learned about this event from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, is that the Lord revealed the rapture to Paul. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Remember the verse we just read in 1 Corinthians 15? Paul said the rapture is a mystery. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. It is a mystery because until God revealed it to Paul, it was unknown. People in the Old Testament knew of a resurrection, but they didn't know about this rapture. The rapture is prophesied in the Old Testament, but that doesn't mean it was revealed to anyone until Paul. So the rapture is a sure thing. The Bible says God cannot lie. And here in verse 15 of Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Take the Lord at his word. Remember to not get down so much in your Christian walk because we have the promise of the rapture. And what else can we learn from this uh, passage in 1 Thessalonians 4? We learn that some Christians will never die. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. If the rapture happens while you're still alive, then you are the exception to the rule. The rule found in Hebrews 9.27, which says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You will never have to see death. The Christian who is alive at the rapture is pictured by Enoch in the Old Testament. Enoch was caught up in a rapture, and he never saw death. Genesis 5.24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Also remember what Jesus said in John 11, 25-26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now listen to this. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? There are going to be some Christians that never see death. But what happens to those who are alive at the rapture? They also get a glorified body. Back to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The dead in Christ saw corruption, so they had to put on incorruption. Those who are alive at the rapture have mortal bodies, so they have to put on immortality. These glorified bodies will be able to fly at the speed of light, go invisible and visible at will, walk through solid objects. And Philippians 3.21 says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is e able even to subdue all things unto himself. This new body will be like the Lord's body. If we get a new body like the Lord Jesus Christ's body, then it will be a flesh and bone body. Luke 24.39 Jesus says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And now look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 15.50 Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.50 So at the rapture your blood drops to the ground, and your body is changed into a sinless, immortal, and perfect body. This body will be able to go through space at the speed of light, through the sea of glass, and into the third heaven. While you are having the time of your life entering eternity with the Lord, it is havoc on earth. Imagine millions going missing and blood piles being left where the people were raptured out. But what else can we learn in 1 Thessalonians 4? We see that the Lord is the one who comes after us at the rapture. He's the one who comes to get us. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You see, the Lord comes to get us at the rapture. Angels don't come to get us. Cherubims don't come to get us. The seraphims don't. Jesus is the one who descends from heaven with a shout and comes to get us. This shows a difference between the rapture in Matthew 24 and the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. And I have to ignore this fact if I'm going to reject a pre-tribulation rapture and take a pre-wrath rapture belief using Matthew 24. Notice how in Matthew 24, 31, the angels gather together the elect. Matthew 24, 31 says, And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I have to admit, this seems like a completely different event. The word rapture isn't in the Bible, as everyone always says when they talk about this. But the rapture means to seize something by force. And that is what the Lord does. He comes down and binds the strong man, which is Satan, who is also the God of this world. He snatches all born-again believers out of the devil's domain. And this is one reason why he is referred to as a thief. Even though the verses that say he's coming in the, as a thief in the night aren't about the rapture. 
they're about the second advent. This is one of the reasons why he's referred to as a thief. Every time a person is born again, the devil loses one of his children. The devil's the god of this world, and when Jesus comes back at the rapture, he snatches out a bunch of people out of the devil's world. That's one reason why he's called a thief. And moving on, what else do we find out in First Thessalonians chapter 4? There are three noises heard at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So we hear the Lord shout. Can you imagine being at work or driving in your car or even doing something you're not supposed to be doing and you hear the Lord shout? Like I said, the rapture is a purifying hope. You don't want to be caught somewhere you're not supposed to be and hear the Lord shout. What does the shout sound like? Or what does he say when he shouts? I believe he shouts, come up hither. John is the disciple whom Jesus loved and he is a type of of the bride of Christ and in Revelation 4 and verse 1 you have a type of the rapture with John being caught up Revelation 4 1 says after this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter so God's voice at the rapture will sound like a trumpet saying come up hither and what else will he say I believe we will hear our names being called. John 10, 3 through 4 says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth, calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. At the rapture, when Jesus calls your name and says, Come up hither, the Holy Spirit will let you know that it's Jesus Christ. You will know his voice. You'll know it isn't something like Project Bluebeam. You'll know the real thing when you see it. Song of Solomon chapter 2 seems to give a prophecy of the rapture. Song of Solomon 2, 9 through 10 says, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Song of Solomon is about a man and a Gentile bride. Jesus Christ is the, uh, is the bridegroom, and he is calling out his bride, a Gentile bride, at the rapture. Look at verse 9 in Song of Solomon, chapter 2. It says, He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. Imagine at the rapture, Jesus Christ looks through the windows of heaven before he gets us. And you can see Malachi 3.10 if you don't know about the windows of heaven. And what if you look up and see him looking at you through the windows before he comes down in the clouds? You'll hear his voice saying, come up hither, but the lost people in the world will only hear thunder. John 12, 29 says, the people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. And the Lord's voice is associated with thunder throughout the Bible. 2 Samuel twenty two fourteen says, the Lord thundered. From heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. Psalms 18.13 The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hell stones and coals of fire. The Lord's voice is a powerful thing. Another instance when it talks about Jesus crying with a loud voice, the very next verses are about the Old Testament saints coming out of the graves. Just like at the rapture of the church, he will shout before the dead in Christ rise. Look at Matthew 27.50-52. And you'll see Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. So Jesus cried with a loud voice, and you have bodies rising up from the dead. And then another example is when Lazarus died, and Jesus cried with a loud voice again. John eleven forty three and 44 says, And when he had thus spoken, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him, and let him go. The same God who made the universe and put everything together is the same one who calls you out, and it's 
it's very possible for this to happen. If Jesus can create everything, then why can't he put all the dead bodies back together that were cremated and give them a glorified body? The Bible isn't hard to understand, it's hard to believe. But what is the next sound you'll hear at the rapture? 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So you'll hear the voice of the archangel. Imagine not only hearing the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also the only archangel mentioned in scripture. In Jude 9 it calls Michael an archangel. So I believe it is Michael for that reason. Many say it is Gabriel, and that's, and, but it's very fitting because Michael is the one who stands up for Israel, and he's going to stand up for them during the time of Jacob's trouble, and that takes place after the rapture. You know why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble? Because the church is gone. God doesn't deal with the church and the Jew at the same time. We all call this time period that comes after the rapture, the tribulation or the great tribulation, but that is really just a description of the time period called the time of Jacob's trouble. But moving on, what is the third sound heard at the rapture? Look at 416, for the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout. So you have God shouting with the voice of the archangel. So you have the archangel and with the trump of God. So we hear the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So we hear the trump of God, and 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Those who believe in a post-trib rapture will make this the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation, making the church go through the tribulation time period. But the last trump is referring to the last sound made by the trumpet. A trump is a sound made by a trumpet. But what else do we learn in 1 Thessalonians 4? We learn that at the rapture we go up to meet the Lord in the air instead of coming down with him to fight. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we are caught up with the dead in Christ to meet the Lord in the air. And this is the first part of the second coming. In the first part, Jesus comes back to get us and we meet him in the air. During the second part of the second coming, Jesus Christ comes back with us and we come down with him. Jude 1.14 talks about this and says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. This is definitely two different events. And we also learn that the rapture is a comfort. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. The rapture is one of the mysteries that was revealed to Paul. And Paul reminds us of this mystery to bring comfort to the saints. God wanted us to know because he is the God of all comfort that he is going to come and get us and get us out of here because we are not appointed to wrath. If a Christian is down and out in his walk, then remind him of this mystery. If, and verse 17 said, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is proof that God preserves us for eternity. And we will never lose our salvation. Now that we have covered the rest of 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's compare this passage with Matthew 24. I believe these are two separate events. Many people on both sides of the argument get very bent out of shape over this doctrine. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says... Be patient toward all men. And pre-tribbers and post-tribbers alike seem to have very little patience with other Christians who disagree with them on this topic. And this shouldn't be. If someone disagrees on the timing of the rapture, who really cares? You don't have to be so quick to call everyone an unsaved heretic because they disagree on something. And they seem to be as much against each other as they are against people like Richard Dawkins and Charles Darwin. The truth is, if they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, then they are your brothers and sisters in Christ. And no matter what they believe, you're supposed to love them and pray for them and not call them names and put them down. If you are so much of a babe in Christ that you get bent out of shape over things like this, 
then you need to focus more on the instruction and righteousness part of the Bible and leave the meat on the table until you grow up. And if you believe in a post-trib or pre-wrath rapture, then that's fine. I still like you. I want to be your friend. And if you are saved, then you are my brother in Christ. I listen to pre-wrath guys. I learn things from them. I like Stephen Anderson. I listen to his sermons. And just because I disagree with him on the rapture, and I don't believe in replacement theology like he does, it doesn't put me on any higher ground spiritually. I believe the problem comes from not rightly dividing the word of truth. As it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, And the pre-wrath crowd for the most part are against dispensations from what I have heard and seen from the guys that teach this. And they believe the church has replaced Israel for the most part that I have seen. They believe the elect in Matthew 24 is referring to the church. But we have to remember all the Bible is for our learning and we can get spiritual application out of the verses that aren't for us doctrinally. But the thing is, we can apply every verse in the Bible to us in a doctrinal sense. Matthew 24 is directed to Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Sure, we can get spiritual application out of it that can apply to us. But for the most part, and doctrinally, it's for the Jews in a tribulation. So what is the context of Matthew 24? So go to Matthew 24, 3. It says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So you have Jewish disciples asking Jesus Christ about his coming and the end of the world. That's the context. And Matthew 24, 13 says, But he that shall endure unto the end... The same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Notice a huge difference here. We don't endure anything to be saved. We are saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and His blood. The gospel of the kingdom preached in the time of Jacob's trouble doesn't match the gospel preached in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. through 4. People will have to endure to be saved during the time of Jacob's trouble. They will either have to endure to the end of the time period without taking the mark, or an exception, die as a martyr. And now look at verse 15 of Matthew 24. It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So the Antichrist is going to stand in the temple, claiming to be God. 2 Thessalonians 2 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. But in the New Testament, God has his people for a temple. 1 Corinthians 6 19 says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? This shows a huge difference. In the church age, our body is the temple. If the church goes through the time of Jacob's trouble, then Matthew 24, 15, would it make any sense? When God goes back to dealing with the Jews during that time, in the great tribulation, or the time of Jacob's trouble, the physical temple comes back. And Matthew 24, 16 says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. This is self-explanatory, that this is directed toward the Jews. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Matthew 24, 20 says, But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. You see how the whole chapter, you can tell it's not directed to born-again believers in the church age. It says, the Sabbath day. Born-again believers in the New Testament don't keep the Sabbath. That was a sign between God and Israel. As it talks about in Exodus 31, 16 and 17, it says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Okay, it is a sign to the nation of Israel, but in the New Testament, Paul doesn't teach that we have to keep the Sabbath. Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, 
or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So you see, it says, which are a shadow of things to come. So the Sabbath comes back in the time of Jacob's trouble. This has absolutely nothing to do with the body of Christ. And Matthew 24, 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Notice great tribulation is a description of that time and not the title. The title is the time of Jacob's trouble. And Matthew 24, 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So there are going to be false Christs and false prophets, and also the Antichrist who performs miracles. They deceive through signs and lying wonders. Now, remember before I told you how the Bible says that the Jews require a sign. And you read that in 1 Corinthians 1.22, it says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Jews require a sign. The devil knows this and will try to deceive them in the time of Jacob's trouble with signs. Ever wonder why you don't see some of the supernatural things in your lifetime now that the Bible talks about? It's because we live in an age where things operate by faith and not by sight. When the Jews rejected their Messiah, God quit dealing with the Jews who require a sign and began to deal with the Gentiles. That is why the sign gifts stopped. You know, speaking in tongues, faith healers, casting out devils, and so on and so forth. Those are signs to unbelieving Jews to get them to believe. And that is why the Bible says the disciples confirm the word with signs following. The pre-trib rapture of the church just might be the beginning of signs to the Jews. Matthew 24, 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Notice again how tribulation is a description and not a title. There will be great tribulation during the time of Jacob's trouble. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. And now look at the things taking place, the sun is darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. We read nothing like this in 1 Thessalonians 4 or 1 Corinthians 15. Matthew 24 is a completely different event. And Matthew 24, 30 says, And then shall appear the, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth more mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. I don't see anything about the dead in Christ rising first and Jesus Christ bringing their souls with him. I don't see anything about getting glorified bodies. This is describing the second part of the second coming where Jesus Christ comes back with us and every eye shall see him. As it says in Revelation 1-7, Matthew 24-31 says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. Notice another huge difference. The angels gather the elect. While in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself comes to get us personally. So there is a completely different rapture involved here. This would be the rapture of the saints from the time of Jacob's trouble. And many will make the elect the body of Christ. While we are the elect, all born again believers are elect. But there is more than one elect in the Bible. You have to go by the context to see which elect it is referring to. Since the whole context of Matthew 24, as I've showed you, is directed toward Israel, then who would the elect be in Matthew 24? Isaiah 45 and verse 4 says, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect, I have even called thee by thy name, I have sent him thee, though thou hast not known me. Why would you make the elect in Matthew 24 the church? When the whole context was about Israel. You can't do that just like you can't take and make the elect of Colossians 3.12 be Israel when that elect is the church. You have to rightly divide. There is more than one rapture. The first resurrection has three parts. You say that doesn't make any sense. Well, you believe in one God that is three in one. And uh, why couldn't you believe the first resurrection has three parts to it? You have the first one, 
which is the Old Testament saints. Remember how we talked about that? When Jesus resurrected, he took the Old Testament saints up with him. He led captivity captive. Then you have a pre-tribulation rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Then you have a rapture of time of Jacob's troubled saints at the end of that time period as you see here in Matthew 24, 31. And did you know that the Bible says the phrase, come up hither three different times? Each time it says come up hither, it represents a different rapture. Proverbs 25, 6 says, Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. For better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince, whom thine eyes have seen. This come up hither would represent the first rapture where Jesus led captivity captive. You see in Ephesians 4, 8, and 9, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And Old Testament saints went down in the heart of the earth when they died. Besides the exceptions like Enoch and Elijah who didn't die, they went up. But you can see saints like Samuel were down there and were said to be brought up. As it says, Bring me up Samuel in 1 Samuel 28, 11. So they were in the lower parts or the nether parts. And Revelation 4, 1 says, After this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So this come up hither represents when we the body of Christ are raptured out before the time of Jacob's trouble. And Revelation eleven twelve, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And this come up hither represents a rapture that happens during the time of Jacob's trouble. Another reason I believe in a pre-trib rapture is because in the church age, the age we are in now, there is one body of believers Galatians 3 28 says for there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus once you get saved in a spiritual sense you are no longer Jew or Gentile we are all one in Christ Jesus this isn't the same in the time of Jacob's trouble in that time period there are two bodies in Revelation 7 4 through 8 you have a Jewish body of believers and in Revelation 7 9 through 17 you see a Gentile body of believers that's a huge difference but I don't profess to know when the rapture is going to be the pre-tribulation rapture I don't profess to know when the post exactly the exact time period when the post-tribulation rapture will be and there could possibly be another rapture two of them in the great tribulation but I don't profess to know everything that happens in the book of Revelation. And I don't profess to know everything in the Bible. But this is what I believe about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. And what I believe about comparing 1 Thessalonians 4 with Matthew 24. So I hope this helps you and helps you to rightly divide.